Good afternoon. Is everybody awake? For the moment. Do I need to get everybody stand up and jump up and down a few times? <laughs> Maybe about halfway through the message. Um, we'll see. I, I, I'm not sure it's going to be a long message. Um, So we're in search of a new music uh, song leader. <laughs> no, we're not. No, we're not. <laughs> oh goodness. Uh, <laughs> when when his wife, the music teacher, burst out laughing, I, we must wonder at his credentials. Uh, uh, oh goodness. And Nehemiah chapter one uh, is where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, what, what a blessing it is for God to answer prayer. Somebody somebody already said that. Um, uh, actually, I think a couple of people have said that, that uh, praising God for answering prayer. Um, you know, it, it, it is always a blessing uh, when we can bring something to the Lord and know uh, that, that God hears us and answers prayer. And just to, to go along with that, this is part of our men's meeting, but we, we were studying, studying what Christ does now as our intercessor uh, at the men's meeting. Um, uh, on uh, Monday night uh, this last week, and looked at uh, through Hebrews, looked at the uh, Romans, looked at a couple different places, but talked about God being uh, or Christ being our intercessor. And in fact, it says He lives to intercede for us. He He's our mediator. Uh, uh, Hebrews talks about uh, how, and I love this in chapter two. It says that He succors us. Uh, that that uh, and uh, succors or suckers, however you want to pronounce it, it's pronounced either way. Uh, uh, but succor sounds much more much much more better. Uh, much uh, fancier, uh, but it, what it means is he runs to our aid. Not just that he helps us, but he, he hurries or runs to, 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 runs to help us. And, and think of that, God has given us the ability through Jesus, Jesus Christ to enter into the kingdom, uh, enter into the, the throne room of grace for help in time of need. Uh, he is there to intercede for us day and night, every single day, uh, every moment that you utter a prayer under your breath, every time that you bow your head, Christ is there to intercede for you because we need his help. We, we don't enter into the throne room of grace on our own. We enter in through Jesus Christ. Uh, but he intercedes for us, and he is not only pleased to help us, he runs to help us. And, and tonight, or this afternoon, we're going to talk about prayer a little bit. We started Sunday school off with, with prayer and then talked about prayer. And we, we talked about praying for our, our the, we're going through the, uh, the model prayer. And we're, this, morning, this morning, we only covered, uh, give me this day of my daily bread. Uh, we didn't get very far. Uh, but talking about our, our, our daily needs and how God will provide. He does tell us to ask, but then we're to have faith and seek, seek after him. And Jesus taught in Matthew 6, to seek ye first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things he'll add unto us. And, but this morning's message was out of Nehemiah chapter 8. You're all here. And the, the idea is that in Nehemiah chapter 8 and 9, we see a great revival uh, we talked about uh, how with the revival there was a, a hunger for the Word of God, there was a reverence of the Word of God, and, uh, and then at the end there was obedience to the Word of God. But that revival didn't start in Nehemiah chapter 8. The, the, the reason there was revival in Nehemiah chapter 8 is because of what we see uh, of two things. We're going to look at Nehemiah chapter 1. This is where it all started. We'll start reading verse 1. It says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. Let's stop here. Father God, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just bless this time of Bible study. And, and the preaching of your word, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to, to fully understand, like they did in Nehemiah chapter 8, Lord, help us to have an understanding of it. But God, I pray that the words that I speak will be from you. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would have freedom to touch our hearts. Lord, I pray that you, that you would give us a burden uh, for revival uh, for our church, uh, for our nation, Lord, for, 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 and for ourselves. Lord, I, I, I believe many will pray this morning, Lord, that you would begin revival in their own personal lives. I pray, Lord, that that prayer would not end today. But, Lord, you'd help us to see the importance of continued prayer and seeking your face for this 
for this thing, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you would work in our hearts, draw us in closer to you, make us more like you, Lord, and, and Lord, help us to be obedient to your word. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Here we have uh, Nehemiah. He is, he is uh, it hasn't mentioned this to us yet, but he is the king's cupbearer. Uh, he is not in, uh, he's not in his native country of Israel. In fact, I don't know that he's ever seen his, his native, he's, he's, he is uh, one of those who have been taken away uh, and as part of the captivity of the Jews that are now in, uh, in Babylon, now in, uh, uh, he's under king, I believe it's Darius uh, during this time and and uh, uh, he, uh, but, and what has happened to the people of Israel is that, uh, well, the Jerusalem's been destroyed and people have been killed. Uh, there are still some that are left, but they're going through a difficult time. And we talked about this morning as, as uh, why that happened, uh, because they had rejected God and, and God over a period of time it, it, it came to a point where uh, there was, the, the, he, uh, he brought about the, the judgment that uh, he always told them was going to be there. So Nehemiah is, is away from home. He's, uh, he's serving another king. He's in another place. And, uh, but but he, some people come and they travel to him. And Hananiah is one. It doesn't tell us the names of the, the others. It just said certain uh, men of Judah. And he asked them concerning the Jews, which had escaped. Those, not, the, not the ones that were in captivity and not the ones who had died, but the ones who had evaded the sword, right? Because when the enemy soldiers came in, they, they didn't let some people live in. They killed everybody they found, but there were some uh, that, that escaped. And it says, those which were left of the captivity concerning Jerusalem. And this tells me something about, about the Nehemiah. It tells me that he's concerned for those people that are still there. He's concerned for, for, for the city of Jerusalem. He's concerned uh, for, for, for the people and, and for, the, for the, uh, the, there, there are no walls. And, and he hears a report. The report is found in verse 3. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of that captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So this is the report that he's heard. The, uh, the, 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 the walls are burned down. The, the, the people are afflicted. They're under reproach. There are enemies all around. Uh, they've got no way to protect themselves. Now, I want you to understand, he is not the first to go back. Uh, we talked about that this morning. Ezra went back first. And, and uh, in, in the book of Ezra, Ezra goes back, and, and uh, I believe it's about 70 years prior to this, and, and uh, begins the, the, the rebuilding of the, of the temple, which had been destroyed. And praise God that he did that, but they didn't even finish that. Uh, and if you go, in, I believe it's the book of Haggai. Uh, in Haggai, uh, the Lord stirs up uh, in the heart of a few uh, because they had gone back and they built their own homes and they built their own businesses and they left the building of the temple undone. And, and, and God confronted them through Haggai the prophet and uh, they stirred them up to finish building the temple. Uh, but the temple's there. There are people living within the city, but there are no walls, and the people are surrounded by the enemies, and they're under affliction, and, they're, and they're, they're, they could be under constant attack, a threat of attack, if not an actual attack. And I want you to see the response of Nehemiah. It says in verse 4, And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and I wept. It grieved Nehemiah to, to hear about, about the nation of Israel, uh, about the walls being destroyed, about the affliction and the, and, and, and the, the trouble that was going on. Uh, this tells me that he asked because he was concerned. Now he hears about the state that they're in, and he's just downright upset. It, it reminds me of a, a, there's a, an old movie, I, it's, it's called, I can't remember the name of it, it's about the Sullivan Brothers, if you know, if you know anything about the Sullivan Brothers, there are five young Americans, uh, the brothers, uh, that, in fact the last five brothers to serve, on it, serve together in any, in any military uh, group, they were all on one ship and the ship sunk. And there's, a, there's an old movie, I can't remember who, was, who actually played the brothers or any of the people. It was a good movie. I, I, I really liked it. My wife would hate it because it's in black and white and made you know, back during World War II times. Uh, but it's a true story. It happened, they made the movie shortly after, uh, they, after this all happened. But, but these five brothers all died on one ship. And there's, there's a point in time when the, when the mother and one, the oldest brother had a, had a wife, or actually I think it was the youngest brother had a wife, whichever one had the wife. And they were there when the soldiers showed up to tell them. And uh, the soldiers showed up to tell them that, that all five were gone. And the mother collapsed. She, she dropped down to her knees and she began to cry. 
Now, I can't, I can't imagine how it would be to hear that one of your child died, uh, to let alone to hear that all five of your children died all on the same ship. Uh, it must have been tragic and ter terrible, and, and there's mourning and weeping when somebody loses a, lo a loved one. And, and in fact, if you ever hear that wail, you'll never, you'll, when, when that, that person finds out, they, you'll never not hear it again. Now, I'm not saying that he was wailing over a lost child, but he, he grieved when he found out the state of Israel. He sat down and he wept. And this weeping and this mourning didn't last just a, a couple of minutes. It wasn't just for show for the people that came to tell him. That he, I just want you to know this upsets me. No, let's look and see what it says. It says that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days. There's a number of days that, man, this just weighed heavily upon his heart. He mourned, he wept, he grieved over the trouble that had befallen Israel. And listen, this was a trouble of their own making. Uh, uh, they could have repented. They could have turned back to God, but they didn't. And, and he knows that and he understands that, but it still doesn't take the, make the grief any less. It says he wept and he mourned certain days and he fasted and he prayed before the God of heaven. It's, it's, it's interesting to me that, that, that his grief and his mourning didn't just overwhelm him, but it moved him to do something. It moved him to begin to pray for, uh, and, and, and the, the Bible says he fasted and he prayed. It means he, 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 he spent time uh, not starving himself, but, but I'm trying the word... I've lost it, uh, afflicting himself and, and, and seeking God. Instead of eating breakfast, he would pray. Instead of eating lunch, he would pray. Instead of eating dinner, he would pray. And this, uh, he, uh, he fasted and for, for a period of time. And isn't it amazing how God works in times of that kind of prayer and fasting? In fact, isn't that what Jesus said when the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, why can't we cast out this, this demon? We've done it before. He said, this kind come out, come out by prayer and fasting. There are some things that God is not going to do until we humble ourselves and afflict ourselves in prayer and fasting. And you say, well, God doesn't command us to fast. Nowhere in the New Testament does it tell us that we have to fast. You're right. It talks about it in the Old Testament. But in the first few chapters of the book of Matthew, they ask, his disciples, they ask the Pharisees ask Jesus, why don't your disciples fast like the disciples of John do? He said, because I'm here. But when I'm not here, then they'll fast. He, he didn't give us a command to fast, but he had the confidence that, that his disciples, his followers, would fast. And there, in fact, there'll be times when we need to fast because there are going to be certain obstacles, certain battles that we're just not going to have victory over until we come to that point where we're ready to, to afflict ourselves and humble ourselves before God and seek it. We may never see revival until we're willing to get to the point of prayer and fasting. And I don't mean prayer as in we pray for it when we're here at church. I mean pray for it like it's on our heart heavy every single day uh, uh, to the point where, listen, I'm willing to forego my breakfast in the morning and whatever it is, my Fruit Loops or whatever it is that I normally eat. I, I normally eat uh, yogurt parfait uh, every single morning. eat the same thing. It's crazy. Uh, but I, I'm willing to forego that and set that aside to pray and seek God's face for for something that God has burdened my heart, uh, some, whether it's over a lost family member that, 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 you're, that you're praying for, whether it's, a, whether it's a, a trial or guidance or wisdom. Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 days in the wilderness prior to his ministry beginning. How much more should we fast and pray? If Jesus was going to do it, how much more should we do it? His grief, his mourning, at, 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 not at his, listen, he wasn't in a bad situation. He's living in the king's palace, eating of the king's food. He was the cupbearer, which meant he, uh, he tasted the food, ate of the food, and he, was, he, he had power, he, he had influence in the king. He carried his meal to him every single day. There are very few people that had that kind of connection with the king. Man, he had it good, but it, it, man, it, it killed him that there was a problem back in his home country where the people were, 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 were afflicted and the city or the walls were destroyed. It caused him to pray. It caused him to, to fast. 
And before we go any farther, I want you to understand this wasn't a one-day thing or a one-week thing. We're, uh, I mentioned this morning, or the, after the morning's message, that uh, this week, Monday th- through uh, Monday through next week, um, uh, we're going to. I'll be here at eight o'clock every morning. Um, uh, my, I'm just just telling, I'll tell my wife this. Uh, uh, I'll be here at eight o'clock every morning uh, to, to pray for revival. I'm putting aside an hour a day just to pray for the revival meeting here at our church. And I know that not everybody can do it. I know that people have work schedules, and and but if you can pray, come and pray. If you can't pray with me at eight o'clock, come in through the day. I'm here most days anyways. Uh, most of you have a key to get in if I'm not here. And, and if that's can't make it here, pray wherever you're at for revival. Pray for the meeting, but pray that God will do a work. Uh, a meeting is just a meeting, and the friends will be gone a week later or a, a few days later. Pray that God does a work that lasts, not just that we have a good meeting. Because, man, we could fill up the seats telling people about the threads. We can get all kinds of churches come in here and be like, hey, they, they, they are tremendous singers. Brother Mark's a tremendous preacher. In fact, every church that I know, every pastor I know loves them and has them to their church. We could fill up the seats in our church, but the next week there won't be anybody here but us. Let's pray that God does something in our hearts and we'll bring in some others that, that maybe get saved. But is it heavy on our hearts to pray for it? Or are we just content to go on as we are? God will bring in somebody once in a while. That, that we preach the gospel. So that, that people get saved on occasion. But are we content with that? Or we, do we want to see God do more? Are we willing to, to put ourselves out a little bit to see God do more? This didn't just take place over a week. It tells us, I don't have a Hebrew calendar in front of me, but it tells us when this, it says the words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, it came to pass in the month of Chislu, in the 20th year. Now, if you don't know the Hebrew calendar, that doesn't make much sense to you. If you jump, jump over to chapter 2, verse 1, and we're, he says that it came to pass in the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. If you don't have a Hebrew calendar, it doesn't make much sense to you. There are approximately four months between when he hears the news and begins to fast and pray, and God answers, begins to answer his prayer in chapter 2. And as we read down through this, he prays this night and day, every single day, for four months. Let me tell you something, this was on his heart. This was on his heart. He, and he was willing to, and I'm not saying he fasted for four months, the periods of fasting, uh, if you didn't eat anything or didn't drink anything for four months, you would die, right? Uh, uh, Jesus fasted and prayed for 40 days, and, and I, I don't know how he went without food or water for that period of time other than God's grace. At the end of it, he was weak and tired. And notice, that was when Satan attacked him, when he was weak and tired, after a period of fasting. When we afflict ourselves, we're opening our, uh, through fasting, we're opening ourselves up to the attack of Satan. But this, this pushed him, this moved him, this compelled him to pray and fast for over four months. Now let's look at his prayer, verse 5. And said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and, and, love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, through the, though there were of you cast out into the uttermost parts of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now there are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and to prosper. I pray thee, 
thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, the king, for I was the king's cupbearer. I want to break down the prayer a little bit. Uh, uh, he, in, the, in verse 5, he, he speaks to whom he's speaking to. It tells us whom he's speaking to. He's speaking to the God of heaven. Uh, he, talks, uh, he, he praises God for his, for his greatness, uh, for, for his power, uh, uh, for, for the covenant, which he, he, his faithfulness, his covenant, and the mercy. Uh, listen, as we went through uh, the, the, the model prayer this morning, it starts out, uh, uh, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It starts out with praise. He did the very same thing. He was praying to the Father and he begins to praise him for who he is and for the covenants which he has kept. And then he says in verse 6, let thine ear now be attentive. He says, hear me, O Lord, when I pray. And and I'm paraphrasing, but he wants to make sure that that the ear of God is attentive to him. Now, I am grateful that we, and and this goes along with what I was talking about, Christ being our intercessor. His ear is always to us. If you are praying for something and I'm praying for something different, he doesn't get confused. He, can, uh, he is God. He can, he can hear you. He, 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 there's no confusion. Uh, he, he's, he's able to take the prayers of all of us and, and run to help all of us because he is God. And, and, he's, and he says, be attentive to me. Why? Because this is important to me. How many times do we say our prayer just because that's our duty to pray versus, Lord, I really want you to hear me. I, Lord, I really long to hear you answer my prayer. The Bible says, an effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. It tells us that, that Elijah was a man uh, like that we are. And it goes with, had all the same temptations. Yet when he prayed, God heard him. Why? Because his, his prayer was effectual and fervent. Effectual meaning it, it was, it was uh, able to accomplish uh, that which he set out to do. Uh, uh, and, 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 and it was a powerful prayer. And it was a fervent prayer, meaning it, it came from within. The fervency is this idea of hot and boiling. Uh, it, it, it was tearing him up. I have a feeling that this prayer of Nehemiah was one of those prayers. It, it was boiling up within him so much that, that he couldn't hold it in. It, he prayed the same thing day and night because, the, 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 again, the heaviness and the, the, the grief over what Israel was going through, what Jerusalem was going through, uh, really bared upon his soul. He says, he says in verse uh, 6, Thy servants, sorry, uh, let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes now open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now day and night. It tells us how much he prayed this prayer. I, I, once, I once heard uh, that to pray a prayer more than once is uh, the, the vain babbling uh, that we're supposed to avoid, uh, that, the, uh, that we shouldn't have to pray a prayer more than once. He prayed this prayer every day, night and day, for four months, and God heard him. Vain babbling is not talking about uh, is not talking about asking God to give us the same thing more than one time. Uh, in fact, we're taught in Luke chapter eleven to do that very thing. When 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 Jesus gives the parable of the man knocking on the neighbor's house, asking for bread for his friend at midnight, the guy doesn't give him bread because he's his friend. He gives him bread because he doesn't stop asking. It's the importunate prayer where Jesus taught that we are to pray with importunity, meaning until, the, until we're given the answer to our prayer or until we're given the reason why God won't do it, uh, that's made clear to us. You just keep praying and trust that God will answer. So, so we see this, this prayer. It's, it's, it's one of those prayers of importunity. It lays heavy upon his heart and he prays it every single day, twice a day actually. Now he goes on to say, For the children of Israel, thy servants, verse 6, so he's, he's praying for, it's an intercessory prayer. He's praying for others. But with this, notice there are three things I want you to see. He says, he confesses the sins of the children of Israel. He confesses the sins of the children of Israel. Now we just read in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8 that they hadn't pulled out the law of God for for, for years, since the days of Joshua. They went through the book of Judges and uh, there, was, there was no glory of God upon the place. When, when Samuel comes around in, in 1 Samuel, it says the light of God or the light of the, in the temple had gone out. There was no pre- real presence of God. They still had the ark of God, uh, but, uh, but God wasn't really there until God spoke to Samuel and said, Samuel, Samuel. 
Now we know that through the period of Samuel's life, God spoke through Samuel. We know that we know that God blessed and used David. God directed Samuel in those days. But the glory of God was gone from that place. The glory of God had been gone since the days of Joshua, and did not reappear until Second Chronicles chapter six. There was a period of time where, although they had the ark of God, although God was working with them and blessing them, they lost the, 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 the glory of the, of the, of the uh, presence of God in that place. We find it comes back again in Second, Second Chronicles, and we're going to go there in a, in a little bit. But, but uh, as, as they're, they're preparing the temple, that as they, they get everything together, they build the temple, they carry the Ark of the Covenant into the place that's set aside as the Holy of Holies. The Levites set that down, and the singers begin to sing, and they bless God. It says that the presence and the glory of God fell upon that place, and so that the, that the priests and the Levites had to leave they, they could, because the presence of God, they could not perform what they were supposed to perform because God was there. He had, the, the glory of God had been gone for that long. He says, I confess the sins of our people. Why? Because they hadn't read the law. They hadn't been instructed in the law. There were things, in fact, in Nehemiah chapter 8, they build the booths and for the first time and since the days of Joshua. They, they keep in keeping the feasts that they were supposed to. We talked about that. There were things that, that had been neglected, uh, the laws that had been let go. and, and, and In fact, uh, many things uh, from, from Joshua on, the mixing of the, of the, of the Gentiles with, with the Canaanites with, with them, the intermarrying and the, the worshiping of other gods. Even Solomon had his hand in it. Listen, there were many sins that needed to be confessed. And he confessed them. He, he admitted and confessed that the people of Israel were a sinful people, but not just the people of Israel. He says, he says, uh, he says uh, Thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. It's not just a national thing. We have done it. And he put himself in it. He says, me and my family, me and my father. It's, it, it, we, we, are all, we have all been a part of this. We have all been a part of the, of the sin and the, the, the neglect of the word of God. So verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and had not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. He says, listen, it's, it's our fault, and, and, and it's my fault, and I, I, take full, I, I take full responsibility for what I've done. Uh, I have sinned against you. My father's house has sinned against you. Uh, uh, the nation of Israel has sinned against you. And then he says, remember, I beseech thee, the words that thou commandest thy servant, Moses, saying, if ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Is that not what happened? God had told Moses that if you do this, I will bless you. If you do this, I will curse you. This was the part of the curse where they, they neglected God and God scattered them across the nations. But in the same breath, he says, don't forget. You said, if my people return back to me, then I will bring them back home. This was his prayer for the, for the people. And remember, he's praying for the people of God. Not for the world. Now, we, we, we should be praying for the salvation of the lost, but he's talking about the people of Israel. Although many had neglected and rejected, uh, neglected God, they were still his chosen people. Verse 9, but if you turn unto me, that's what I mentioned, uh, and keep my commandments and do them, Though these, were, though these were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are my servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and thy strong hand. He says, these people that, you, that we're talking about, they're your people and they're the people that you saved. You saved them by your by your great hand, remember that they're your people. Isn't that what Moses did when God was going to destroy everybody? 
Do you remember, do you remember that? Uh, Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments, uh, and, and the people, he was gone for 40 days, and apparently 40 days is just two days too long, and they went up to, went up to Aaron and said, listen, listen, uh, he's gone, we don't know what's happened to him, he's probably dead up there, so will, will you make us another god? And Aaron said, no, that's stupid. No, he didn't. He was stupid. He said, bring me all the gold. You got all the earrings. Break them off. All the gold that you, you've got and bring it to me and we'll throw it in the fire. They threw it in the fire and melted it down and they made themselves a golden calf. And God got angry because God knew what was going on. And he was going to destroy the people of Israel. And Moses said, no, they're your people. These are the people that you brought out of Egypt. And the world's going to say that, 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 that God couldn't even keep them now. And it, it would be a stain upon your name. They're your people. And God changed his heart. He says, changed his mind. Now, he says he repented. God doesn't, can't repent of sin. But it's talking about a change of mind. And he did not destroy the people of, God, the, the people of Israel. Some died. Uh, some, 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 uh, were, were, some Israelites were destroyed in all of that, but God is, did not destroy them as a nation. He says, remember, they're your people. Now, how does this, how does this affect us? We're not talking about, a, we don't have some city that we're praying about with the walls destroyed and the people under attack. Except for we do. We're Christians. And you look around us and uh, the, the state of the, of the church and uh, the, the state of Christianity around us in our country is just is deplorable. I'm not saying every church and I'm not saying every Christian is, is, uh, is in, in trouble, but uh, I, I even believe that our idea of Christianity is, is uh, the, the traditional American, uh, you know, it's got, we got to the point where we can't be put out to serve God anymore. We can't be put out to, 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 to even to, to, to think about. It's just too much to ask of us to come to church uh, to, or to give. or to, it, it, it doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Churches are, are closing their doors all over the country. Uh, uh, churches are cutting out services because nobody shows up anymore. Uh, churches are, uh, pastors are quitting the ministry and there's nobody to take the pulpits. Why is all of this? It isn't because God isn't God anymore. It has to do with the people. And we can say, well, we live in a, a wicked and perverse nation, and that is absolutely true. It, it, it saddens me at, what, at the direction that our nation and our state is going, and, and many of the, the, the choices that are being made as far as uh, the, the, the politicians are pushing uh, abortion up until and even after, after, after birth. Do you get, can you wrap your mind about, around that? Because I can't seem to get it. That, that they don't understand that that's life at conception, not life after the mother decides that it wants to be life. But that's okay with our country and okay with many people in church. If you're here today and you believe in abortion, uh, let me tell you, it, 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 there is a value in life intrinsically given, to, given by God, not by man. And you can't say that it's not a person because God says, I knew you before I formed you in the belly. It's not at heartbeat. I, 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 I applaud all the abortion bills, that, uh, the heartbeat abortion bills, but they were a baby without the heartbeat. And they were life. Listen, if they found, uh, if they found a single cell organism that could reproduce anywhere outside of the, our atmosphere, they would, we found life on Mars! Woohoo! And the astronaut says, I found it and I stepped on it. What do you think would happen to him? Yet they applaud all these people that, for the most part, it's, it, it's for people's convenience who murder their children. That's acceptable in our country and becoming more acceptable by, by Christians. It should, not, it, should, it should never be. If you've been watching the news or the social media about the, our local area, you know about the, the church uh, that's under attack right now because of of a, a sign that was posted. Now, whether or not you agree with the, 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 the way the sign uh, posted the, the, 
the phrase, the tr it's still the truth. But the hatred, the, the family's been threatened with death, the burning of the church and their home. The, the, his children have been threatened because he, he took a stand. Listen, it's the same stand that we take. There was, a, I don't know what happened, but there was supposed to be a large protest outside of his church because of the belief that they took. That they dare put it out on sign. It's coming, folks. That's the world that we live in. But even inside the church, you find people who struggle with that. Why? Because we have the same problem Israel did. We don't separate ourselves from the world. It's that simple. Because instead of being transformed by the renewing of our mind, we're conformed by the world around us. And if the world can change us, get us to fit in with them, then we no longer fit in with the word of God. And we've begun to accept what God rejects. Sin. Listen, it, it's, that's only a small portion of it. When, when we're, talk, we're not just talking about revival of people that are uh, about abortion. There, it's, 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 a, it's just a whole sweeping of people just moving away from the, the, the Lord, moving away from the Word of God, moving away from the standards of, of, of Scripture. Things that were once unthinkable are now acceptable. In fact, not only acceptable, they're proud, proudly flaunted. And even by churches. So when I say that we, that, that we need revival, and I'm talking about uh, Christianity in America, it's absolutely true. And that doesn't mean that, that you're in that position, you're waving that flag, or you're, or, or, or you're, or you're, you're, you're preaching uh, pro, or you're pro-choice, whatever. But that doesn't mean, what, what, that, what that means is that we should look around us and see the state of the church today, and it should be heavy upon our hearts when you see a brother and sister in Christ uh, who, who is in sin, or even notice that it, that how far we have gone away from the word of God and the, and the law of God, it should be a burden upon our hearts that drives us to pray. To pray for forgiveness and to pray for revival that God might do something, that God might send someone, that the Spirit of God might work and, and, and change us, at the very least, change me. Because when he prayed and, and confessed the sin, he prayed and confessed his own sin. Along with, it's easy to pray about somebody else's sin. Lord, our nation is in a mess. I, I've been asked to, to, to pray at, uh, several times for the state senate and for the state, uh, and this last time for the, for the, uh, for the House of Representatives. Um, and I have been tempted to go in there with a, there was a prayer a while back, I don't remember who prayed it, uh, some guy got it. That was the last time he was ever asked back. Um, I, and I have been tempted to go in and, and ask God, but that's, Honestly, that's grandstanding, and, and, and I'm not blaming him. I, 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 can't per, I personally don't think it's what the Lord wants me to do. I take every opportunity to try to get to know some of them and build some kind of relationship with them, not so that they ask me back, but so that I might be able to be a witness to them. And I've actually found some saved people up there. Praise God, there are saved people up in our state house. Uh, some, not, not all, and in fact, not many, but some. But it's easy to pray for the sins of America. Because God, our, 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 our nation is a sinful nation that's turned its back on God and the number of, of those who are outside of or away from God who reject God, the numbers increase uh, yearly. The numbers of, the, of believers decreases yearly and that's accounting for all churches, not just, uh, not just Baptist churches. Uh, the, the, it, it, it saddens me, the wickedness that goes on and, and, and we, can, we can pray, but it's easy to pray about the sins of others. But, but Nehemiah didn't pray just about the sins of others. He confessed those sins. But he confessed his own sin. Because right along with the rest of them, he had ignored the commandments of Moses, or the God had given to Moses, and hadn't been living by those things. And, and, and he confessed that. And, and, and the, what, what does it say there in verse? 
Verse 7, we have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest. Listen, there needs to be a heart of confession. That, listen, I know that I'm not up to par. God, I am sorry. Lord, you have showed me things that I haven't gotten right. God, I am, I am sorry. God, I have been proud. I have been selfish. I, listen, all those things are sins that we need to ask God for forgiveness for if they're part of our life. And, and, and seek God to do something. Because in this, not only does he ask for forgiveness, but then he asks for the, for the keeping of the promise. And, and turn with me back to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, chapter 6, sorry. I'm reading through this this week. This in 1 Kings chapter 5, it's the same account, but two different, two different accounts of it. Chapter 6 is Solomon's prayer. Of God, the, the glory of God has just entered, filled the temple. If we find that uh, in verse uh, 13 and 14 uh, of uh, chapter 5. I'll go ahead and read it because we, we talked about it. It says, and it came to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For he is good, for his mercy endureth forever that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord, so that as the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of God. The glory of God has finally returned. And then Solomon prays, and he's dedicating the temple of God. He's dedicating the temple that they have for, for God's service and saying, Lord, uh, we want this to be your house and that, that the people come and pray here and that you would, you would answer them here. And there comes a point that he begins to pray and he begins to pray very specifically. We won't read all of them, but I want to read a couple of them. Let's see, look at with me. Verse 22, if a man sin against his neighbor... This is part of his prayer. And, and an oath be laid upon him to make him swear, and the oath come before thine altar in the house. Then hear thou from heaven, and do and judge thy servants by requiting the wicked, by recompensing his way upon his own head, and by justifying the righteous, by giving, by giving him according to his righteousness. And if thy people Israel be put to worse before the enemy, because they have sinned against thee, and, and shall return and confess thy name, and pray and make supplication before thee in thine house, and hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sin of thy people of Israel, and bring them again unto, he unto the land which thou gavest them and to their fathers. Verse 26, When the heaven is shut up and there is no rain, because they, they have sinned against thee, yet if they pray toward this place, confess thy name, and turn from the sin when thou dost afflict them, then hear thou from heaven, and forgive the sin of thy servants and of thy people Israel, when thou hast taught them the good way wherein they should walk and send rain upon the land uh, which thou hast given them unto thy people for an inheritance. If there be dearth in the land, if there be pestilence, verse 28, if there be blasting or mildew, locusts or caterpillars, if there be enemies besieged them in the cities of their land, whatsoever sore or whatsoever sickness there be, then what prayer or what supplication soever shall be made of any man or of all thy people Israel, when everyone shall know his own sore and his own grief, shall spread forth his hands in this house. Then hear from heaven thy dwelling place and forgive and render unto every man according unto all his ways, whose heart thou knowest, for thou only. What's going on here? He's specifically saying, listen, if your people sin and you bring this upon them and they turn back unto you, hear them, forgive them. And heal their land. Bring them back. And if this happens, if this person sins, or this nation sins, and, and, and you, you bring famine upon them, and they turn back to you, and they make those things right, hear them. Heal their land. Over and over again, he prays that. And when he finishes his prayer, the Bible says the fire fell from heaven and consumed the sacrifice. And this is a, this is a huge sacrifice. Of 22,000, uh, I think it was 22,000 uh, sheep and uh, 12,000 uh, oxen. It was a massive sacrifice. And fire came down and consumed that sacrifice. And then in chapter 7, God begins to speak to, to Solomon. And we've, I have preached this. I have heard this, this, this passage preached. And he says, listen, because of the dedication, because of the sacrifice, because of the worship, and because of your prayer, 
This is my answer. Verse 12, And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for a house of sacrifice. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. God's response to the sacrifice, to the dedication of the temple, and to the prayer was, if my people, which are called by my name. Now here's a question. Do we have a temple that we go and worship at? This is not the temple. This is not the sanctuary. This is a place that God has given for us to meet. What temple needs to be dedicated for, the, for God to, to bless it and to work? This temple right here, Romans chapter 12, 1. If, it says that, uh, uh, from, I'm not mixing up verses down in my head. Uh, I'll just start. Uh, the, the, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service. This body needs to be dedicated unto God. It needs to be holy, set aside for God's use and God's purpose. There needs to be sacrifice of me, removing myself from me and say, okay, Lord, I know I'm, I'm sinful. God, I know I am I, I, I'm impure. Lord, my thoughts, I, 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 I'm not able to control them. But God, I, I give it all to you and I ask you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. And, and it's amazing what God can do when somebody truly lives that out. And then the prayer, if my people, which are called by my name. Now that promise, and we need to understand that promise was for Israel. That was a specific promise for that temple, uh, uh, for that temple and for the people of Israel. And Nehemiah counted on that. That's why he prayed. Because God promised if my people now, that, te- that temple was no longer there. It wasn't. It had been destroyed and rebuilt, and the one that was rebuilt wasn't anywhere near as beautiful or as large as the, the first one. But even though it was a different temple, it was still his God who would keep his promise. That place was still a place of sacrifice. And he trusted in that. He says, God... We are sinners. I have sinned. My people have sinned. We are, we are a sinful people. And Lord, you kept your word that if, we, that if we sinned, you would scatter us abroad to the uttermost. And here we are, because that's where he was. he was. He was not in Jerusalem. He was not in Israel. He was a, he was a, a servant in, a, in another kingdom to an, unga- an unchristian king. He says, here we are. But your word also says... And he reminded God of the promise that God had given to Moses, which was almost, which is very similar to the promise we read in 2 Chronicles. So what does that have to do with us? We're, we're, we're in the New Testament. It's not those promises weren't for us. James chapter 4, draw an eye unto me and I'll draw an eye unto you. Almost word for word, really. It's prayer. The promise of God is true. And you, listen, you may not see, uh, see uh, you might come down, to, uh, kneel down in your seat uh, today and, and pray that God will bring revival in your life and walk out of here unchanged. You know how I know that can happen? Because it's happened to me. I've been to services where they preached revival and said, draw a circle right where you're at and ask God. And I did it. I, I didn't literally draw a circle on the carpet. I would have probably gotten in trouble. But I, 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 in my mind, I drew a circle. I said, Lord, right here, start the revival right here. And I walked out, and nothing changed. You know why? Because my heart really wasn't for revival. I was just excited about the message. Before I could have a, a real heart for revival, I need to see, I, I, I really need to have a heart that's burdened and a heart that is grieved over my sin and over the destruction and over, over a people, a, a, a people of God who are, who, it's hard to really tell that they're the people of God. When they can go out and live like the world and be unrecognizable outside of church and they show up on church on Sunday and they're like, oh, you're a Christian. I never would have known. Are they? I don't know. I was them once. But I also know that God can take that heart and that life and change it. 
if my people which are called by my name. Prayer. My encouragement, my, 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 my hope is that you'll join me. We'll, we'll close out the service with just a, a prayer meeting, I guess. You want me in praying for revival. And if you don't have a heart for revival, then pray that God gives you a heart for revival. Because I'll tell you something, it's going to cost you something. Real revival is costly. It takes sacrifice. It takes dedication. It takes setting yourself aside and letting God have control of your life and letting the word of God uh, dictate your life. That's what revival is. It's not just an excitement that gets stirred up because some fiery preacher comes in who's better than me on next week and, 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 and does a better job. Uh, last, last year, he stole one of my messages that I'd been working on for a month. And I was like, Arr! But it was better coming from him than from me. Otherwise, God would have given him something else. But listen, we can get stirred up in the moment, but the key is that we become grieved and we become burdened, that it becomes a daily prayer, not just a, a prayer in the moment. That yes, we want to see revival because you could ask any Christian all across the country and say, do you want to see revival? And they'd all raise their hands and say, yeah, I want to see revival. But when they really see what it might cost them, what shows they might have to stop watching on TV, what, what things they may have to set aside in their life, what they do need to focus on, the, 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 the reading of the Word of God, and most of all, prayer. Listen, I, I, I'm not downplaying the Word of God. It is absolutely necessary. But we, uh, we have such a, uh, a simple understanding of what prayer can do for us that, that we don't truly understand what all it's for. And God has burdened my heart with that more and more over the last, last several weeks. And we, we come and we, we, we pray. Uh, our prayer time should, should be in secret for the most part. And I'm not saying that we don't pray together as a group. We, we, we are to do that as well. But if you don't have the, the prayer time alone at home in your own closet, away from everybody else, the rest of it is all just for show. Seriously. When, when Nehemiah, we didn't look at it, but when Nehemiah stands before the king and the king sees his face and that burden that's been on his heart for four months that he's been praying for day and night, man, it's just heavy upon his face. And it's the first time the king has ever seen him not happy. And he says, why is your countenance sad? That's a bad thing when your boss, is, especially one who could take your life, says, why are you sad today? Did you eat something funny? <laughs> Remember, it's the king's cupbearer. And it says he prayed. And then he approached the king. He laid, laid before the king the problem. Now, he didn't pray a long prayer. He didn't say, excuse me, king. Oh, Father, thou art in heaven. You know, he didn't do that and run off and go pray and come back. He had a moment say, Lord, please help me. But that was backed up with four months of praying day and night for this very thing. This was an answer to the prayer that, that he had. Praying for revival here today is good. Praying for it tomorrow and the next day and the next day and the next day and the next day until God brings revival in your life and the lives of, our, of the people in our church, that will bring revival. The rest is just for show. Let's go ahead and we're going to spend some time. Pray by yourself. 